going in and seeing her each day and she really liked, um, she wanted me to sing for her. She had a stroke. She's in Warwick Hospital and um, she was saying, oh, they are buggers here. They are buggers. So, <laughs> which means um, she was upset with the nurses. Um, um, she was probably just upset because she had a stroke. Anyway, so this song's from her perspective, um, being, being in the hospital, not wanting to be there really.
until my life runs out. Till my life. Okay, um, thank you, Luke. I'm now very pleased to introduce Dougal Hein to you all. Um, I've invited Dougal to talk about the measurable and the unmeasurable with respect to the environment, but I don't know where it will lead because uh, Dougal always leads off into very interesting places and ideas. Dougal is somebody who's uh, worked in many different areas. He's, he's, he's been an entrepreneur. He's set up various businesses. He's a specialist in reviving uh, rundown parts of the world, particularly the Brixton Village uh, um, uh, project is a very good example. He uh, runs a festival and a whole project called the Dark Mountain um, Project, which is involved with really rethinking, re, uh, reimagining uh, the world uh, as it could be after things change as they are inevitably changing now given the way we misuse the resources on the planet. Um, and he's a writer and an editor of books and uh, generally uh, an all-round good egg. <laughs> uh, and so, Dougal, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, I was, I was sitting on the train coming up here today uh, from London, um, not entirely sure, um, uh, got slightly more of a picture um, sort of since I got here from talking to Christopher, what sorts of backgrounds you guys were going to be coming from, um, but knowing what the title of the course you're doing or the module that you're doing is, and knowing that I'd been asked to talk about the measurable and the unmeasurable and knowing that sometimes when I start talking about this, it can sound as if I'm sort of, um, I'm against measuring things, and that's not what I'm really on about. And I thought, where's a good place to start from? And I thought, um, music. Music's a good place to start from, because it's an example of somewhere where the things you can measure and the things that you can't measure meet. And I thought I'd start by actually asking whether um, any of you are musicians. Totally. Yeah, what do you play? Uh, oh, what's that? It's a sort of a box with just a drum and you sit oh, on it. Oh, it's the little box that you can make sound like a whole drum kit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. And, uh, cool. Yeah, play in a sort of a drumming circle. Yeah. Here in Birmingham, there's uh, different guys to play in different bands here in Birmingham. Okay, yeah. great. I know, I, I love those things. Um, yeah. And how about you? Yeah, I play uh, violin. Okay. Violin. Classically or folk music? Classic. Oh, classic. Okay, yeah. right. And anybody else? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I mean, it, 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 it doesn't matter. I mean, it was, and then it was just complete serendipity that I came off the train and I was standing in New Street Station, um, realising that the battery on my phone had died, so I couldn't call Christopher, thinking um, I must remember how to get to Aston, and sort of slightly going round in circles, and someone bounded up to me, and I looked, <laughs> and it was Luke, who I hadn't seen for two years, and he said, uh, it's wonderful to see you. I've left my bags over there. Everyone's going to think they're a bomb. <laughs> 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 so I wandered over with him, and, uh, and there were his bags, and there was his guitar, and he came for lunch with us, and then he said, uh, how about I uh, start the session, because I told him on the way that I was going to start with music. Hello, come in. You've missed the music, but I'm only just starting the talk. Okay. So yeah, so I thought, since we were going to talk about the relationship between what can be measured and what can't be measured. Music felt like um, a good place 
to start, because on the one hand, um, I mean, if you've ever seen uh, musical notation and musical scores, you know, they're divided up into, you have sort of the 4-4 four, four or 3-4 four or whatever it is at the left-hand side, you have you know, the division over time, you have these kind of things that are a kind of graph of stuff that can be measured, and you can use physics, you can um, you know, analyze the sounds in terms of numbers. But if you try to play music as if that's the only thing, you might just about manage to, to sound like um, one of those player pianos. You know, they used to have the kind of rolling um, paper with holes punched in it, and it would read the holes mm -hmm. and play the notes on the piano, and you'd had a sort of mechanical thing. Um, but, you know, when you play with people, you know, whether it's in a really improvisational context, playing in a band, or whether it's even playing in an orchestra in a situation where you do have a score that you're following, you, know, you can't just treat that like a computer program. You have to bring yourself into it. You have to feel while you're playing, as well as being rigorous with um, the notation and with the, the stuff that can be written down, the stuff that can be represented as numbers. Um, and I think that that idea of the relationship between the stuff we can measure and the stuff that we can't measure, and that music is the result of you know, getting things right on both of those levels, like technically, um, you know, rigor, practice, um, you know, not being sloppy, but also the importance of things like feeling and presence. And you know, I so I used to travel around when I was eighteen or nineteen. I spent a year travelling around Europe with my guitar. I'm not anywhere near as good a singer as Luke, but I was travelling around busking. Um, does everyone know what the word busking means? It's uh, when you play music on the street and you put your guitar case out and people put money into it, if you're lucky. <laughs> and it's, it's, I, I sometimes think that everyone who goes to business school should be sent out busking for three weeks before they start the course, because it's a really useful way of learning some things about money that often in most of our experiences of money in modern societies we don't really get. Because if the first way that you ever earn a living is by you know, having a Saturday job working in a shop or collecting glasses in a pub or lots of the things that lots of my friends did when we were 16, 17, 18 to earn a bit of pocket money. Are you off, Luke? Thank you. Sorry. Um, if that's the first way you earn money, you get this kind of idea that there is a sort of a mechanical equation by which you put an hour of work in and you get eight pounds or seven pounds or uh, about one pound fifty when I was um, 16 um, out and that you're converting time into money in some predictable way. Whereas what you learn if you take your guitar or, uh, or your drum or your violin and go out and play on the street is that... At the moments when you are feeling a bit low and you're feeling, um, you're, you're sort of thinking about something else, or you're worried about whether you're going to have enough money for a bed in a youth hostel tonight, and when you're kind of absent-minded, people might put some money in out of sympathy, but you won't get very much money landing in your hat. And at the moments when you lose yourself in what you're playing and you're not thinking about anything else, you're actually feeling, enjoying the song. Even sometimes when I was having a really bad day, I, I could turn that from the kind of being worried about things and feeling bad to actually putting that feeling into the music. And there's loads of traditions of music, whether it's sort of blues or fado music from Portugal or you know, lots of places in the world where there are traditions of how you put you know, difficulties and hard things into music and feel them and play them out. Um, but you know, when that happened, lots of people would put money into my hat. And so you know, even with something um, like work and making money and so on, the possibility that there is a non-linear relationship, that things that are hard to measure, which are do, to do with feeling and presence, make the difference between, you know, good work, work that has an effect on people, work that matters to people, that feels meaningful, and you know, and maybe busking is a particularly pure form of it, because you're not doing anything obviously useful. You're just making the street, hopefully, 
a more pleasant place than it would otherwise be. And you know, if you're really, if your heart's not in it and you're not really there, then maybe you're making the street a more unpleasant place than it might otherwise be. But you know, um, these things are kind of at the heart of what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the idea that we have mostly grown up in societies which have got the balance a bit wrong between how much we emphasise the stuff we can measure and the stuff we can't measure. And you're sort of allowed the stuff that we can't measure in your private life and at home, but in sort of grown-up public situations, it's not really considered legitimate. If you can't show it with numbers, it's not real. And what I want to talk about is the history of that to some extent, to make at least to suggest some stories and some lines we could think about about the history of that. And then um, sort of the application, the effects of that, and also the ways in which we can apply it, including to thinking about um, the questions that we sort of file under sustainability and the environment. Um, and also around um, technology and the ways in which we use networked technologies. Um, and to suggest that there are things we can learn from revisiting the history of how we came to emphasise the stuff that can be measured and to treat the stuff that can't be measured as a private or not quite grown up area of reality. Um, which. You know, by going back to that, we can learn things that can help us to address some of the questions that arise around the kind of, you know, both the mess that the world is in right now, and also the ways that the world is changing as these technologies make it possible to do things in very different ways to how we were doing them even five or ten years ago. And going back into that history, for me, um, starts in the 17th century. And you know, my original degree was in English literature. So I was lucky to get to spend several years sitting around reading and talking about plays, poetry, um, essays, novels from, you know, from the Middle Ages through to the 20th century. And the thing that I got most interested in from that was looking at what, tracing the patterns in the changes in people's background assumptions. If we assume that the writers who we're still reading from any generation will tend to be, on the one hand, exceptional individuals and unusually able to put things into words compared to most people within that time, and on the other hand, because they were able to have careers doing this, usually were resonating to some extent with other people who were alive at that time, and that was why they were able to you know, persist and make a living and, um, you know, spend their lives as writers. You know, Shakespeare was not sat on his own writing things which didn't get appreciated until the 20th century. Shakespeare was writing the equivalent of the TV sitcoms of um, you know, his day at the late 16th and the early 17th century. And one of the things that interested me was tracing what changed in the assumptions that people had about reality, about what it meant to be human, about how we made a good job of um, being alive over the centuries. Um, for example, one of the things that struck me was that in Shakespeare you get characters who are very good at being practical and rational and they won't believe in anything that they haven't got the evidence and the data for. So that is, it's not a type that doesn't exist yet and they are kind of useful people for you know, being um, generals in an army or something like that. They're not regarded generally as being the sort of wisest people or the people you go to the answers for really difficult questions to. Um, and the sort of, the characters who seem like they are treated as being the examples of, you know, um, what it is to be knowledgeable to understand the world in Shakespeare tend to fall closer to Hamlet when he sort of says to his friend Horatio, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy. There's a sense that the most important things in life, the most important things in reality, are often things that can't be approached directly, that we don't have full knowledge over, that we might only be able to reach towards by telling stories, 
or through using symbols or saying it's a bit like this but that doesn't that's not all of it and as I was reading um, through the generations that came afterwards what struck me was that that changed and that within a hundred years or so of Shakespeare um, the assumption was sort of the other way around if you couldn't prove it with evidence and with a rational argument, then it wasn't real. Um, you know, if it wasn't, if our philosophy didn't have an explanation for it, it wasn't real. And in a sense, what stands in the middle of that transition is the beginning of modern science and the beginning of this extraordinary breakthrough of you know, the ability to have reliable to a significant extent ways of talking about and knowing things that have been utterly mysterious in the past. Think about gravity and think about oh, what somebody before Isaac Newton would have said about why um, when an apple comes off a tree it falls and hits the ground. And we sort of take this for granted now from being kids but it, when Newton comes up with um, a mathematical way of explaining what's happening there and a theory for what's going on and describing it in terms of forces that can be measured and that you can use that as a, you know, a way of being able to predict certain things in certain situations, it's an astonishing breakthrough. And what happens is people go, wow, okay, if we can keep thinking like this, we'll get rid of all of the mysteries and we'll be able to trace this. And they don't think, you know, we'll stop believing in God and we'll become atheists. They don't anticipate Richard Dawkins. What they think is, we'll be able to follow this all the way back to God and then we'll be able to describe the whole universe as this giant machine. And after the last 200 years where we've had all of these really particularly bloody wars over which version of God is right, if we can just use the kind of stuff that Newton's doing to show what the answer is, we won't have to have wars over it anymore. And you can see why this desire to eliminate mystery was very attractive at that moment in history. There's one, I mean, if you mm. take Galileo, though, he was proving that the Earth wasn't the centre of everything, but because of the religious belief at the time. Yes. I mean, they suppressed everything and made him um, deny everything Absolutely. No, I mean, you're right. And Galileo is a couple of generations earlier than Newton and in a different context um, in a Catholic environment. And I think, yeah, probably a big reason why the scientific revolution in England that began sort of around the time of the Royal Society, about 50 years after the later part of Shakespeare's career, um, part of the reason why it flourished was because there had already been all of this disruption to religious authority. In, um, in this part of the world. And in a funny way, actually, if you look at the, the there was a strange allegiance between the kind of the, the Protestant, the Puritan Protestants and um, the uh, new, uh, they would have talked about natural philosophy rather than science, actually, in the 17th century. The word science in the way that we use it comes later. And the word science literally just means knowledge. Um, but both the, the sort of the more radical Puritans and the new scientists um, were very keen on um, simplifying a plain language uh, in contrast to the kind of the ceremonious and um, you know, hard to reach and kind of mysterious language of the Catholic Church. And so, yes, I mean, it's, it's a more complex story and you're absolutely right. But if you, th if you think about the, the sort of the really bright, brilliant people, the people who were kind of writing essays, the people who were interested in new ideas in that time, they were not wanting to be atheists. They were not wanting to overthrow Christianity on the whole. I mean, some of them were quite irreverent um, people who were fairly anti-authority, but a lot of them thought of themselves as very much kind of devoted to God and to religion and just that they had found a new way to understand the glories and the wonder of, um, you know, of God's creation. That's certainly how most of the early scientists would have described what they were doing. Uh, even if some of the kind of the priestly authorities, as you say, would have been not particularly happy with some of the things that they were discovering. Um, but my suggestion is that along with the amazing breakthroughs that the new science brought, 
there was also a hidden unscientific assumption, which is not necessary for doing science, but which has tended to accompany the spread and the dominance of modern science in the shaping of modern societies, in the Enlightenment and in the industrial era and so on. And this assumption is, well, there's more than one way of stating it. The first way that I'll say it is, it's the assumption that the set of things which can be known is the same as the set of things which are real. Or the other way around, the set of things which are real, the things which exist, is coextensive with the set of things which can be known. In other words, everything which exists, everything which is real, is capable of being known by human beings. And if we don't know it now, we'll know it later. And you know, this is an extension of, it's a sort of enthusiastic going over the top of the experience of discovering that you know, we can know things which were utterly mysterious until very recently. But it's not a logical conclusion of it. And so on the one hand, the domain of things which we knew has grown in a certain sense as a result of science. On the other hand, the stuff that we can't reach, the possibility that there is stuff which is real, that exists, or that matters, that's important in any sense, and which can't be known, has been sort of ruled out of play. And without wanting to take a strong position on religion um, and on what anyone should believe or not believe, I think it might be that one of the things that religion has been useful for in human societies at times is holding an awareness that there might be things which are deeply important but are mysterious in a way that we're never going to get to through science. Um, and so what I'm saying, I guess, is that over the course of the 17th century, amongst the kind of the best educated, the most forward-thinking people of the time, um, the unknown came to be divided into two categories. Stuff that is real and we're going to know one day, in other words, a bit like America before Columbus was sailing there from a European perspective. You know, uh, so the unknown becomes the unconquered land and science is this kind of conquering march of progress that is going to take over more and more of this unknown land until one day we've colonised the whole of reality. And then the other kind of unknown, which is the stuff that's not real. Old wives' tales, superstitions. And I think that that dividing of reality into the stuff which will be known one day if we don't know it already, and the stuff which is not real because we will never know it in that sense, is one of the things that lies in the real background of the kinds of societies and cultures we've grown up in. And I don't think it's actually very scientific or very... It doesn't, it doesn't hold together philosophically very well. It's just an assumption that is a historical legacy from the moment at which we discovered the techniques um, that have brought us all of the wonderful scientific knowledge that we've gained since the time of Newton. With the a sort of old wives' tale, lots of it was based on um, things that were observed. So mm -hmm. it, they're not totally unscientific and unproven. No, absolutely. But what tends it's to happen is that... Um, they get precisely this division that I'm saying gets imposed on them. So basically, you look at what happens when indigenous knowledge is studied by scientists, and basically it's nonsense until the point where it's believed by science, and then it's real because science has produced real knowledge. Um, and it's sort of, you know, either it falls within the domain of the conquerable, the, the possibility that there might be things that, you know, we have a kind of rule of thumb about, a hunch about, which is encoded into traditional knowledge, old wives' tales, etc., which have real practical use, but which are never going to fit the degree of rigour which science demands of knowledge, because it involves things that can't be measured. Um, I mean, I'll, I, I'm going to try and just sort of take us through a few more steps and then open this out into a discussion, if, that, if that's okay. Um, but yeah, let's 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 footnote that one to come back to because you're right. There's definitely more we can. There's, there's threads we can pull on there around traditional knowledge. I think. So, just to try and put a few more pieces in this um, this line that I've been trying to suggest. 
I'm saying that, and, and yeah, one more thing then on, on what knowing comes to mean at that point historically, that you know, knowing from the point of view of science is being able to measure things. Okay, if we can't measure it, it's not real, is to a large extent the, the other proposition supporting this kind of um, definition of everything that is real can be known everything that is known can be measured. And the problem for me with that is that I think it is, I think it holds true to say that meaning is precisely the thing that can't be measured. That stuff that can be measured is, um, you know, and, and I think there might be a, a reason for this, which is that Measuring is about comparing the sameness, and meaning is about difference. Um, so in order to measure two things, we have to treat them as having an essential sameness, and then we're just counting what has more and what has less between the two. Um, whereas, if we think about what's most meaningful to us in our own lives, it's often quite elusive of that kind of knowledge. But that doesn't mean that we don't take it seriously. Um, and you can take this one step further because you go from you know, everything that is known can be measured to everything that can be measured has its price. And if you think that that's an exaggeration, actually you know, one of the places I want to go with this is the way in which environmental management has progressed towards saying the way that we solve our problems is to put a price on everything, including the things that are not currently being priced and traded. And if we manage to measure everything and put a price on everything, then we can come up with a solution. And part of where I'm going with the argument that I'm making here is that that is a mistake in my view, which is not to say that we should give up measuring things or give up pricing things, it's just to say that we need to find a, a humbler way of using the kinds of knowledge that can come from measuring and pricing things that allows room for us to cohabit with the unknown and the unmeasurable rather than to either deny its existence or say, we can hypothesize that it exists and we'll have proved that when we've measured it. So, yeah, I mean, a story that sort of that might loop into that thing about you know, meaning being that which can't be measured. I, I spent six months a few years ago teaching English in China. I was living in a small, uh, well, small by Chinese standards city. It would be quite large if it was a, a British city. Um, and there were only about 20 foreigners in the whole city, and about 400,000 people living there. And I was working with four other guys who were all from English-speaking countries in this one little private language school. And after about six weeks of being there, I started to feel incredibly claustrophobic in like, having lunch and dinner with the same four guys who I didn't necessarily have that much in common with besides the fact that we happened to be white and native English speakers. And one day I had a big argument with one of them over lunch. And so I decided, right, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna find everybody else in this city who speaks enough English that I can have a conversation with them because my Mandarin was pretty minimal at that stage. It took me about two months before I could pronounce the name of the street that I was living on <laughs> well enough that the taxi driver would actually get me there. Um, and so I, I went out and for the next two weeks I managed to find most of the other foreigners in town and sort of uh, get to know them a bit and I managed to find the various people who were kind of eccentric enough that they'd really dedicated to, the, to themselves to learning English despite the fact that from this particular part of um, China they were, there was not much likelihood they were ever going to find themselves going to an English-speaking country. Um, and I had a really interesting time. And about two weeks later, my boss, who was one of the kind of the five guys in this small language school, uh, sort of took me out for dinner. And after dinner, there was a sort of lulling conversation. And he sort of looked down. And, said, and he looked up and he said, Dougal, I think you're better than I am at, at making friends with people who are different to you. And I just laughed and I said, well, I think I'd be pretty lonely otherwise. <laughs> because my default assumption is that everybody's different to me and everybody's different to everybody else. 
and that that doesn't mean that we can't be friends with each other or meet each other or find things in common. But it really struck me that I think a lot of people actually you know, want as much as possible to have a social self which they can say is the same or is, you know, with, belongs within a category that allows them to think they're not different to certain other people who have certain characteristics in common. So in this context, it was that you know, this guy felt like he was different to people from other countries, but not different in that way. I mean, this is, I'm making him sound like a dreadful racist. He wasn't. It was a sort of background assumption that he hadn't really thought about that much until this episode, and that this episode got him thinking about. Um, and that, you know, to me, that relates in a way to what we've been talking about in terms of meaning and measurement. That, um, you know, the... How do you measure if a person is similar to you or not? By, exactly. And, you know, you, what you do is you try and, uh, you know, give yourself a series of attributes and you go, okay, this person and this person and this person also have those attributes, and therefore, you know, we belong together, and that person doesn't have those attributes, and so I find them slightly intimidating, and I'd like to get to know them better, but I think you know, there's a certain strangeness there. And actually, the thing we're all afraid of is that we're all strange on the inside and trying to hide it mm. uh, at some level. Um, uh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe you're all normal on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> My experience of getting to know people has been that everyone's strange on the inside. <laughs> um, and, you know, what this is about is our ways of seeing and our ways of thinking about the world. And I, and I do think that these are a legacy of these kinds of changes in culture that happened in what um, historians and literary scholars and so on often call the early modern period. They talk about this period in the 17th century at the beginning of modern science and these changes in ways of knowing as um, the early modern period, the beginning of the modern world. And part of what I hope I can give you in what I'm saying here, and for some of you this will be something that is very much a background assumption already because it's, you know, there are different places you can come to this understanding from, but part of it is we are very much impoverished when we see the past as a crap version of the present. You know, and that might, be, that might sound like a crass and ridiculous thing to say, but I think that often in the background in our kinds of society and culture, there has been an assumption that you know, um, history is a sort of a graph which is hopefully going upwards, sometimes with some bumps in the road, and that when we look back in time, what we have is sort of earlier prototypes for how we live now. And actually, you see this in the kind of the wars of science and religion today. The one thing that Richard Dawkins and um, biblical literalist fundamentalists like um, what's his name? Santorum, who's a scary man who's running for the Republican um, candidacy in the US, then. the thing that they have in common the thing that they agree, they, they agree on, which I violently disagree with, is both sides think that Genesis is an early physics and biology textbook. You know, they think that the Bible was a first draft at science. And that's, you know, that's, 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 that's Richard Dawkins' argument against Christianity. And it's also what the fundamentalists who want to argue against Darwinian evolution believe as well. Um, they just have different conclusions about whether it's a good science textbook or not. And to me, having you know, gone on these journeys through reading what people thought about and wrote about in different periods, it seems fairly clear that no one before the 17th century ever thought of the Bible like that. That um, you know, it was a collection of and I don't mean this in a sort of modern liberal way where this is something that's less real than um, you know, factual scientific truth. I mean that factual scientific truth was not the ultimate kind of truth. Um, and the Bible was a collection of stories. And these stories were true, but the sense in which they were true is a different sense to the sense in which scientific facts are true. 
Uh, Umberto Eco has a book called Faith in Fakes, and there's one of his essays in there where he says, you know, in the Middle Ages, there were three different cathedrals in Europe which had amongst their collections of relics the skull of John the Baptist as a young child. Now, whatever you think is going on there, it's not that people were so stupid that they couldn't work out that given that John the Baptist in the Bible lives to be an adult man and then has his head cut off, the skull of John the Baptist as a young child is an unlikely thing to find. It's something else. It's a different kind of relationship to reality that people have had in different times and places. And it's not simply a poorer attempt at the same kind of relationship to reality that we've had. I'll give you one other example that might help give you the experience of what I'm talking about. Since these you know, changes in our ways of knowing in the 17th century, I think the most common way of thinking about what we have here and about what we're doing when we're seeing is to imagine that there are kind of two camera lenses in the front of our heads and that light passes through them and is projected in there and that somehow you know, through the mutter, mutter, mutter workings of our brain um, we get to see stuff and don't think too carefully about the later parts of that and what, whether, whether what we're seeing relates to something that's out there or only an experience in here, because that way philosophy lies. But um, the idea that seeing is basically a, a passive receptive thing in which we are receiving stuff into these windows in the front of our heads that are a bit like the lens of a video camera. Before the 17th century, for a long time in Western culture, the dominant understanding of what we were doing when we were seeing was that the gaze was something like a kind of erectile organ going out from the front of the head. And that when I look at you, I'm touching you with my eyes, with my gaze. And in scientific terms, you, know, you can take this to pieces and go, this is bizarre nonsense. All I want to say is that that way of knowing and talking about what happens when we're seeing, I think, brings us closer to the actual experience of what's going on. It actually talks about something which goes missing when we only think about seeing as being, you know, pointing a camera at things. That, you know, there is a subtlety, a kind of knowledge about the intimacy involved in eye contact, which is captured in that pre-modern way of knowing and which goes missing when we overemphasize the, the scientific um, way of knowing, which brings us other insights about what's going on there. So you know, rather than simply discarding everything that, uh, you know, the ways we've explained things in the past and saying, you know, that was an early prototype and we've now improved on it, what I want to say is that the past is more like a book full of the many different ways that people have made life work and made sense of what it is to be human and all of the strangeness that goes with it in different times and places and that sometimes it can give us really helpful ways of talking about things and sometimes the the ways which to draw us back to the theme that I'm talking about the ways which emphasize the stuff that can be measured and de-emphasize the stuff that can't be measured can be for practical purposes not as helpful in at least some circumstances and now, this stuff about ways of seeing does bring us to the question of what happens when we start to see everything in terms of what can be measured and what can be priced. And you know, my proposition is that the, the economic order that we've been living under turns the world into a game of who can turn the most stuff into money quickest. Um, and I don't even say capitalism because I think that many of the attempts to um, create alternatives to capitalism have stuck within most of the parameters of that game and have simply then tried to say, and how can we share that wealth in ways which are less socially destructive than the ways it tends to get shared in a winner-takes-all free market situation. Um, and what happens then is that we no longer see anything. You know, somebody who is an enthusiastic player of that game can no longer see a mountain all they can see is a storage unit of minerals that can be traded on futures markets even while they're still in the mountain waiting to be um, carved out of it. 
Um, and that same way of seeing is also what leads us to have universities and corporations that have human resources departments. Because it's that way of seeing that turns everything into a resource rather than us being able to see what it actually is. And I suggest that once you have a human resources department, you've stopped treating people as people. And you know, in the dealings that you will undoubtedly have with human resources departments, unless you're very lucky in your onward careers, keep that in the back of your mind as a source of strength when you're having to deal with the, the madness of it all. Um, and what worries me is that, you know, as somebody who has been passionate um, you know, all my life, about the fact that things have been going badly wrong in our societies, that we have you know, been destroying our home. You know, that's what it comes down to. We've, we've been bound up in a way of living that, you know, in the name of producing more and more stuff and converting that stuff into money, we've been turning what is not a bad place to live into a much worse place to live. Um, you know, it's a bit like if you chopped up your furniture for firewood. Um, now, so I've been passionate about that all my life and a lot of the work that I do comes out of the desire to try and help um, help us discover the possibility that we can do things differently partly by noticing that people have done things differently in different times and places and not being romantic and saying we should go back there but saying maybe there are things that they can teach us about stuff that we accidentally forgot while we were concentrating on other stuff that we got good at along the way historically um, what concerns me is that other people who share much of the, that sense of um, you know, something's gone badly wrong, it matters, it's urgent, we need to do something about it, we cannot go on like this, have increasingly got bought into the idea that to be effective about doing something about it, we need to create a green version of the same game. We need to measure everything and put a price on everything and solve the problems by you know, looking at the mountain in just the same way that a futures trader looks at the mountain and you know, putting the value on it and then coming up with some kind of mechanism in the same way that a futures trader comes up with some complex uh, financial mechanism. But this is a, a futures mechanism that's trying to guarantee the future of the stuff staying in the mountain. And... I think that it won't work and that even if it did work the stuff that matters most would still get lost along the way like um, towards the end of uh, The Revenge of Gaia James Lovelock has a sort of an aside where he says if we manage to solve this crisis in a way that makes this world that has for millions of years been a living thing and has you know, had us within it as part of this mix. If, we, if, if our solution to it means that we create an eternal life support system in which the world only continues to be a living thing through human beings being this sort of set of uh, tubes inserted in and out of it like a patient in an intensive care unit. That's not winning. You know, it's possible to imagine, and in fact, there's a great design provocation by a design studio called Atelier Van Lieshout, called Slave City. And they designed and did an exhibition of this, this perfect zero carbon closed loop city that just happens to be basically a concentration camp. And part of what it flags up is that if we only define the problem in terms of the things that can be measured in terms of you know, seeing the world as a system and implementing whatever fixes it takes to keep that system going, we might manage to do that while also creating hell on earth. And I think that it's only by sort of not stopping measuring things, but becoming a little bit humbler about what measurement can and cannot give us access to and about the importance to it being... Well, I mean, I interviewed Rowan Williams a long time ago, before he was Archbishop of Canterbury, and one of the things that I remember him saying was, what would you stake your life on? Sooner or later, everyone has to ask, what would you stake your life on? 
what is more important to you than staying alive? You know, what needs to be there for life to be worth living? And I think that um, you know, there's a risk that sustainability becomes about uh, constructing systemic solutions to sustain life at all costs without asking what is it that makes life worth living. And you know, to me, it's only by placing the stuff that can be measured in relation to the stuff that can't be measured that we can allow room in our conversations and in our work for the things that make life worth living. And so my suggestion is that rather than seeing data as the true reality hidden behind the confusing evidence of our senses, we see all of the richness and confusion that we have access to through our senses as what is real, and data as being a bit like footprints in the sand. Footprints can be really useful. You know, they can help tell us about something that happened when we weren't there. They can be suggestive. But in order to understand them, we have to bring to bear our experience. If we're aliens who've just landed from another planet and all we've got to go on is the marks and sand, we probably won't be able to draw that many conclusions about you know, what shaped thing made those marks. Um, so that's kind of um, what I'm looking for is, is some metaphors, some ways of thinking that help us allow for the stuff that can be measured, allow for its, its usefulness without taking it too seriously. Um, you know, another way of thinking about it is to think about, uh, well, we talked about music and music notation. How about choreography? You know, choreographers have systems of notating um, the movements of a dance. And to another skilled choreographer who has got the, the physical embodied experience of the stuff that you can't write down that goes into dancing, that notation can be very, very helpful. But you can't, you know, not just that to you or me, it just looks like a set of unreadable dots and squiggles. You can't study that set of dots and squiggles and by studying that, arrive at something particularly useful from it. It's only by dancing that you can acquire the kinds of hard to measure knowledge which make the bits that are capable of being summarized and written down come alive. And you know, again, in terms of the history of our ways of knowing, I think that one of the difficult things that we've inherited, and this goes a bit further back than this period in the 17th century that I've been focusing on, it goes back sort of into the Middle Ages, really. Um, at a certain point in time, we began to treat knowledge as stuff that can be put in books and sort of measured by you know, the number of inches along a bookshelf. And if any of you end up as academics, you'll discover that increasingly the, uh, you know, the number of inches on a bookshelf that you produce times by some fairly crude measures of which of those inches ha are heavier than others becomes a career-defining set of obligations, which is one of the reasons why I'm not an academic. Um, and actually, what I would say is that even the best stuff that gets put in books, even the really good stuff, is just like good choreographer's notation. That knowledge is actually a person knowing something. It's an experience that you have as a mind and a body, and let's not get into the relationship between mind and body, because that's another place where things went wrong in the 17th century. Um, but you know, knowledge starts as a lived experience. And then, with varying degrees of skill, we try and notate that lived experience in the form of written language. And perhaps that gets put in a book, and perhaps one day somebody else comes along and takes that book off the shelf. And the extent to which they then have the experience of knowledge is the extent to which, well, it's sort of like something that's dry and you add water to it and it comes back to life. And your ability to add water to it is you know, the amount of lived experience that you are able to bring to bear to the point where you begin to have something that's a bit like meeting the person whose words you're writing and experiencing some of the experience of knowing or a variation on it in the same way that 
a different choreographer working from one choreographer's notation will be able to read it, but they'll give a different interpretation of it in the same way that, um, you know, uh, oh, what's his name? So Leonard Cohen wrote Hallelujah, and then you might have heard the version of Hallelujah that someone did on The X Factor, or you might know the version of Hallelujah that's on Jeff Buckley's uh, album. And it's the same song. The stuff that you can dry out and write on paper is basically the same, but you know, everyone adds their own different kind of water to it, and so it tastes slightly different, even though you can recognise the common ground. And, and to me, that's kind of the story of what goes on with knowledge, is that somebody has an experience of knowing on their own or together in, in an encounter with other people, and then... you. Know, tries to distill that into a written form that you can put on a shelf and then someone else comes and takes it off the shelf and you know, if they're unlucky it will be dry and meaningless to them and we've all had that experience of you know, something on your reading list that doesn't come alive to you when you try and read it or if you're lucky you're able to bring the right ingredients to it for it to kind of come alive again and be something that is recognisably of the same kind as the experience of knowing which the person who wrote it had. And finally, we say that, or I started off saying that a piece of music is not like a computer program. Um, that you, know, you can't treat an orchestral score as a mechanical thing. You have to bring that measurable and you know, traceable thing that can be written down together with the lived experience, the bodily skill of you know, years of practicing, and then you know, if you're managing to be present rather than absent-minded and thinking about how you're paying the rent this month, then something magic can happen and it comes alive. But of course we live in a world where computer programs are increasingly important. And you know, I'm not a Luddite in the abusive sense of it. I actually think that if we go back and read about the history of the Luddites, we find that they were much more interesting and much more right than the way that the term Luddite gets used. Um, but that yeah, let, let's, let's put that one to one side. I, um, I'm quite enthusiastic about the stuff that people do with network technologies. I mean, how many of you are on Twitter? Any of you? <laughs> Twitter is amazing. Twitter is my favourite. <laughs> and you, you probably think Twitter, if you're not on Twitter and you've not had much experience of it, you probably think Twitter is a place where people who think they're much more interesting than they actually are tell each other what they're eating for breakfast. Because that's basically how, uh, how the media sort of represent Twitter. Twitter is amazing. Twitter is a bit like a sort of social prosthesis that you know, allows you one step further out than you would otherwise get through seeing people face to face. Um, sense of what's going on in the lives of people who you've either met or heard about or have some reason why you think they might be interesting. Um, and it's also a bit like a giant, endless pub conversation within which you know, all of the best pub conversations that you've ever had and all of the worst things you've ever seen go on in a pub are all going on all the time, all over the world at once through this system. Um, but what makes Twitter amazing is mostly not about the, the software, the stuff that can be um, measured and written down, the stuff that can be represented as code. In fact, what's so good about it is that they built a simple, powerful system and then didn't try and control too much what people did on the top of it, and people invented all sorts of different ways of using the artificial constraint of the 140 characters, which is actually not a million miles away from the artificial constraint of a sonnet or a haiku. And you might think that that's an absurd comparison, but that's only because the sonnets that we read are the really good sonnets. Okay. If you had to read every sonnet that got written in the history of sonnet reading, you might find that the quality level wasn't actually that much higher than the quality of everything that gets written every day on Twitter. Um, I know as a writer that I've become a better writer through the exercise of having to constrain myself to that, but also through the, the instant response. Now, if I manage to say something that really resonates with people on Twitter, then 50 people will retweet it, as we say. You know, they will pass it on. And that tells me that I found a way of saying whatever it was that I was trying to say, whether it was a joke or an observation or a quote or whatever it was, that that thing 
resonated with the kinds of people who I've ended up following and who follow me and those two groups mostly but don't entirely overlap and so on. Um, and that is that kind of instant social feedback of the kind you get when you're having a conversation with someone face to face but the kind you don't really get when you're sat in your room trying to write an essay. That's actually a really, you know, quite a human helpful thing and not a particularly, yeah sure I can measure the number of retweets that I get but the thing that makes other people go, oh, that's really good, I'll pass it on, that's hard to measure. I don't think measuring is that useful for getting it. And so the bit that I'm saying here about, you know, is that e even these systems that we build out of computers which can only deal with stuff that can be measured, computers are made of numbers, people are not made of numbers, um, that even the systems we build out of that become most interesting when our hard-to-measure, more fully human selves hitch a ride on top of that infrastructure, a bit like sort of hobos hitching a ride on the freight trains that um, were you know, crossing the, the United States in the 19th and early 20th century. The infrastructure wasn't built for these purposes, and yet it becomes something that we can um, kind of make use of to our own... Um, messy, never fully measurable ends. And to me, uh, that coexistence and the growth of that, I mean, the first time you saw the Google homepage and you or someone else put a search term in and clicked go, you knew why Google was good. Most of you have probably seen Twitter, but by the sound of it, haven't got to the point of experiencing why Twitter is good probably takes six months on average from someone first encountering Twitter and starting to play around with it to the point where they go, oh, now I get why people are excited about this. And one of the reasons I like talking about it is because maybe I can help speed you down that path. But um, you know, the, the difference between you know, what happened when Google launched in about 98 and what happened when Twitter launched in about 2007 is that the, the code part, the part that can be represented in numbers, in proportion to the harder to the, the bit that is made up of stuff that can't be measured as easily because it's to do with the social and the cultural and the customary and the human, um, the, the proportions have been shifting. So there's more of the kind of the messy human stuff riding on top of the um, the kind of tidy infrastructure than there was 10 years ago. So even as the world becomes more technological, it's not that we're all turning into robots. It's that we are making the robots do silly dances. Um, you know, um, and that's really where I, want to, where I want to kind of wrap up my bit and then we can throw this out into a discussion and pick up any of the threads or the kind of um, the bits that haven't made sense or the questionable assumptions that I've thrown you is, you know, let's not stage a fight between measuring things and the things that can't be measured. It's not an either or, um, but let's look at the kind of the endless dance or the kind of the music that happens in the interaction between those things which we can measure and represent as data and track down and those things which, you know, which we know, which we feel, which we know matter to us but which become very elusive when we're in measuring mode because I think that if we can hold on to both of those things that's the best shot we've got of puzzling our way through the mess that we're in and making the best job we can of living through the unfolding of all of the crises that are around and ahead of us in the time that we happen to be alive.